Dental assistance at risk of contact with blood and other protections deteriorate by carefully following the infection safety guidelines. Minimize your risk of transmission in the dental office. Chain of infection. The six link infectious agent, reservoir, portal of exit, transmission of entry and susceptible host. Infectious agent. A pathogen must be present, for example, a bacterium, virus, fungus, parasite, or prion. Virulent. Virulent. Degree of pathogenic the strength of the cause disease. Reservoir. Place where microorganisms normally live and live. For example, animal, water, bio burden, contaminated. Maintain excellent hand hygiene and thorough cleaning and disinfection of contaminated surfaces will minimize reservoirs for microorganisms. Portal of entry. To cause infection, a pathogen must have a portal of entry or means of getting into the body. Portals of entry for airborne pathogens are the mouth and the nose. Hence, why for COVID we have to have our mouth and nose covered. That's the way that the virus enters body through the mouth or through the bloodborne pathogens must have access to the blood supply to gain entry into the body. This occurs through a break in the skin caused by a needle, a cut, or even a human bite. Also occurs through mucous membranes of Cavity. A susceptible host, a person who is unable to resist infection by the pathogen, an individual who is in poor health, chronically fatigued, under extreme stress, or who has a weakened immune system, is more likely to, be, to become infected. Staying healthy, washing hands frequently, keeping immunizations up to date will help members of the dental team resist infection and stay healthy. Types of infection. Acute infection, symptoms are often quite severe and appear soon after the initial infection occurs. Chronic infection, a microorganism is present for a long period, sometimes for life. A latent infection, persistent infection in which symptoms come and go. For example, cold sores, like we were talking about with the herpes type 1. Oral herpes simplex and genital herpes are latent viral infections. If the virus is in the body, dormant pretty much, but it can come and go. So you might have an outbreak one month, three months might go by and you don't you won't have a reoccurrence, but then the fifth month you might have one. An opportunistic infection is caused by normally non-pathogenic organisms and occurs in individuals whose resistance is decreased or compromised. Uh, and what they, what they mean by that is uh, sometimes the elderly, sometimes the very young children, or somebody that has just the uh, disease like HIV, which lowers your immune system, or your immune system is weak, despite anything. Modes of disease transmission. Direct transmission. So this occurs when someone comes into direct contact with the infection region or infected body fluids. For example, blood, saliva, semen, vaginal secretions. So this pretty much blood and saliva is going to happen in the dental office. Uh, semen, vaginal secretions, that can happen in the medical office, such as the uh, uh, office of a OBGYN or just a gynecologist. Indirect transmission. It involves the transfer of organisms to a susceptible person through, for example, the handling of contaminated instruments or touching of contaminated surfaces and then touching the face, the eyes, or the mouth. So indirect transmission can happen when you're cleaning up after a procedure, which that, um, let's say the instruments catch somebody that, ha that had um, HIV or they have some type of, or they had uh, hepatitis B or hepatitis C, et cetera. You're not touching the person that has the virus per se, but you're touching something that came in contact with the person that had it. 
So that's indirect transmission. Airborne transmission, so also known as droplet infection, it involves the spread of disease through droplets of moisture containing bacteria or viruses. This is usually how they're saying that uh, COVID-19 is spread through droplet infection. That's why they tell us that we need to wear uh, face coverings, we need to cover our nose, we need to cover our mouth, because if somebody speaks and saliva flies in our face, or if somebody sneezes or coughs, etc., that's how it's transmitted to the other person because it's in the air. Aerosols, sprays, and spatter contain saliva, blood, and microorganisms and are created with the use of the high-speed the high handpiece, ear water syringe, and ultrasonic scaler during dental procedures. Mists, droplets, particles larger than those in aerosol sprays. Spatter, large droplets, particles contaminated with blood, saliva, and other debris. Happens during a dental procedure when the mucosa, the mouth or the eyes, or, or non-intact skin is splashed with blood or blood contaminated saliva. This is when the PPE comes in handy. Uh, you need to wear your goggles, your mask. You need to wear it the way that it goes, not on your chin. You need to have your mouth and your nose covered. Um, you can wear like a, a cap, a hair cap, uh, a gown over your scrubs, etc. Other modes of transmission. Parent, parent, parental transmission. This can take place through needle stick injuries human bites, cuts, abrasions, or any break in the skin. Bloodborne transmission, it involves direct or indirect contact with blood or other body fluids. Food and water transmission, occurs when contaminated food that has not been cooked or refrigerated properly, or water that has been contaminated with human or animal fecal material is consumed. Fecal oral transmission, occurs when proper sanitation procedures such as hand washing after the use of the toilet are not followed and one of the many pathogens present in fecal matter is transmitted when the infected person touches another person or makes contact with surfaces or food. Very important to wash your hands after using the bathroom. Um, you won't believe how many people do not do that even in a dental office. So the immune system, the human body receives resistance to communicable diseases from the immune system. A communicable disease is one that can be transmitted from one person to another or by contact with the body fluids from another person. Um, inherited immunity is present at birth and acquired immunity is developed over a person's lifetime. Naturally acquired immunity occurs when a person has contracted and is recovering from a disease. Active immunity and passive immunity. Artificially acquired immunity, antibodies are introduced into the body by means of immunization or vaccination. So basically, um, a vaccine, it's um, like a watered down, a watered down um, portion of the of the virus or the bacteria. So basically they're injecting you with that, um, but it's watered down, it's not gonna be as strong. So generally when you receive a vaccine for something like the flu vac vaccine that they're offering every year, they're basically injecting you with a weaker str uh, strain of the flu. So when you get the, the um, vaccine, you might even get sick because your body is trying to build immunity um, and trying to fight off that virus or that strain that they've injected into your body. Every dental office should have an infection control program designed to prevent the transmission of disease from patient to dental team, dental team to patient, patient to patient, dental office to community, including the dental team's family, and community to dental office to patient. Patient to dental team. Most common route is through direct contact, touching of the patient's blood or saliva. Droplet infection occurs through mucosal surfaces of the eyes, nose, and mouth, hence why you need to have your nose, your mouth covered, and your eyes wear your goggles. It can occur when the dental team member inhales aerosol generated by the dental handpiece 
or air water syringe. Indirect contact occurs when the team member touches a contaminated surface or instrument. Ways to prevent disease transmissions from the patient to the dental team member by using PPE, like gloves, masks, um, hand washing, rubber dams, patient mouth rinses, rinses. From the dental team to the patient, it's very unlikely to happen. It can result if the dental team member has lesions on the hands or if the hands are cut while in the patient's mouth, permitting the transfer of microorganisms. However, if that's the case, you should be wearing gloves anyway. Infection control measures that help to prevent team to patient transmission include masks, gloves, hand washing, and immunization. From patient to patient, has occurred in the medical field but no cases have been documented in dentistry. Although such transmission is possible, contamination from instruments used on one patient must be transferred to another patient for this to occur. Infection control measures that can prevent patient to patient transmission include instrument sterilization. You should never be using dirty instruments on two different patients. Surface barriers. So those are the tapes that you put on the hand pieces, uh, the overhead light in many areas of the um, operatory. So anything that you touch a lot during the procedure, even drawer handles, you'll usually put surface barriers and that's just like a tape hand washing, gloves, and the use of sterile instruments. From the dental office to the community, microorganisms can leave the dental office and enter the community in a variety of ways. Contaminated impressions sent to the lab. Uh, most offices have a special solution that they will spray the impressions uh, before sending them off. Contaminated equipment sent out for repair. Even when an instrument or a handpiece is uh, damaged and you need to send it out to repair, you need to sterilize that and then mark on the bag as uh, needs repair or damage, etc. Because you don't want to have, um, you don't want to send out a dirty instrument or a dirty handpiece for somebody else to touch. Um, in theory, transportation of microorganisms out of the office on the dental team's clothing or hair. Um, most of the time, when you work in the dental field and you've had a procedure or you work with general dentistry or with an oral surgeon and you've had a procedure that there was a lot of aerosol, a lot of blood, a lot of saliva spat, uh, spatter, um, just a lot of stuff in the air. It is always your best bet that when you come home, you take your clothes off at the door and just hop in the shower because you're bringing all that stuff back. You bring it in your car, you bring it in your shoes, etc. The following measures can prevent this type of disease transmission. Hand washing, changing clothes before leaving the office, disinfecting impressions and contaminated equipment before such items leave the office. The, from the community to the dental office to patient. Microorganisms enter the dental office through the municipal water that supplies the dental unit. That water is just regular water, it's not filtered water. Waterborne organisms colonize the inside of the dental unit water lines and form a biofilm. As water flows through the handpiece, air water syringe, and ultrasonic scaler, a patient could swallow contaminated water. This is true. This is why you need to flush the water lines at the end of the day. Roles and responsibilities of the CDC and OSHA in infection control. Federal agencies that play important roles in infection control for dentistry are the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. You've heard that a lot lately. Um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is also known as OSHA. And OSHA does do visits to the dental office. The CDC is not a regulatory agency. It issues specific re recommendations based on sound scientific evidence on health related matters, and it establishes a standard of care for the dental profession. OSHA is a regulatory agency, so it issues specific standards to protect the health of employees in the United States. In 1991, based on the CDC guidelines, OSHA issued the Bloodborne Pathogens Standard. 
as a dental assistant, it is imperative to follow all of OSHA's guidelines and recommendations. The CDC guidelines for infection control in dental health care settings. It was released in December of 2003 by the CDC. The guidelines expanded upon the existing OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard and have included some areas that were not already covered. The guidelines are based on scientific evidence and are categorized on the basis of existing scientific data, theoretical rationale, and applicability. Guidelines apply to all paid or unpaid dental health professionals who might be occupationally exposed to blood and body fluids by direct contact or through contact with contaminated environmental surfaces, water, or air. In 2016, the CDC Dental Infection Prevention Summary of in March of 2016, an easy to understand read summary of the 2003 guidelines. It includes additional topics and information relevant to dental infection prevention and control since 2003, including the following. Infection Prevention Program Administrative Measures, Infection Prevention Education and Training, Respiratory Hygiene and Cough Etiquette, Updated Safe Infection Practices, and Administrative Measures for Instrument Processing. The CDC Rankings of, ev of Evidence, Category 1A, Category 1B, Category 1C, and Category 2, and then an unresolved issue. OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, the most important infection control law in dentistry. It is designed to protect employees against occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens, such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and human immunity immunodeficiency virus, which is also known as HIV. Employers are required to protect their employees from exposure to blood and other potentially infectious materials in the workplace and to provide proper care to the employee if an exposure should occur, which means your employer needs to um, provide PPE for you. So they need to provide uh, at least gloves, masks, um, usually gowns for um, to wear over your scrubs. Um, goggles, they will sometimes have, but you can buy those yourself. And the caps. If you work with an oral surgeon, usually they have those hair caps. They'll provide those for you. The BP. The BBP applies to any type of facility in which employees might be exposed to blood and or other body fluids, which include dental and medical offices, hospitals, funeral homes, emergency medical services, and nursing homes. OSHA requires that a copy of the BBP be present in every dental office and clinic. So make sure you know where that is when you get into the office. An exposure control plan clearly describes how the office complies with the standard and universal precautions is referred to in the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard. Standard and universal precautions. Universal precautions are based on the concept that all human body, all human blood and body fluids, including saliva, are to be treated as if known to be infected with one of the bloodborne diseases, HBV, HCV, or HIV. So it means that you're going to treat everybody the same. You, um, you're always going to wear your gloves, your mask, your PPE, because you're going to treat everybody as if they had any of these diseases. You don't want to contract it, right? So you need to take care of yourself. You need to treat and think everybody like everybody has it. The CDC expanded the concept and changed the term to standard precautions. Standard precautions integrate and expand the elements of universal precautions into a standard of care designed to protect healthcare providers from pathogens that can be spread by blood or any other body fluid, excretion, or secretion. It is not possible to identify those individuals who are infectious, so infection precautions are used for all healthcare personnel and their patients. Categories of employees. The OSHA BBP standard requires employers to categorize tasks and procedures during which an employee might experience occupational exposure. BBP defines an occupational exposure as any reasonably anticipated skin, eye, mucous membrane contact 
or percutaneous injury with blood or any other potentially infectious material. So this is basically any procedure that you can do in the dental office, except for a um, like a new patient exam where you just take an X-rays, or uh, the you know the six month recall which you take X-rays again. But even then, um, the doctor is going to use a basic setup which includes a, a mouth mirror, an explorer, and sometimes cotton pliers. But you can get poked with that explorer when you're cleaning up. So you know that's anticipated that you might come in contact with blood or saliva or etc. Post exposure management. Accidents happen. Before an accident occurs, the BBP requires the employer to have a written plan. This plan explains exactly what steps the employee must follow after the exposure incident occurs and the type of medical follow-up that will be provided to the employee at no charge. So basically, if you're, let's say you're cleaning up after a procedure and by mistake you poked yourself with a dirty instrument or trying to recap the anesthesia, the needle on the anesthesia, and you poke yourself and these instruments were just used on somebody. You don't know if that person was being honest on their medical history form. So your employer or the office needs to have a plan specifically for these type of situations and it's going to tell you, okay, so now this happened, you got poked with the dirty instrument, what's next? What do you do? Um, where are you going to go? What doctor? What's going to be provided for you during that care? Uh, the office should be taking care of that bill, etc. That's the post exposure management. So that's the plan. They need to have one. Employee training. The BBP standard requires the dentist or the employer to provide training in infection control procedures and safety issues to all personnel who may come in contact with blood, saliva, or contaminated instruments or surfaces. The employer must keep records of all training sessions, and the record must include the date of the session, the name of the presenter, the topic, and the names of all employees who attended. Most of the time, they'll probably just uh, uh, let you watch like a video, and then they'll, they'll on a piece of paper, they'll write that, who attended, the date and the time, etc. Hepatitis B immunization. So OSHA requires the dentist to offer the hepatitis B virus HPV vaccination series to all employees whose job include category one and two tasks. The vaccine must be offered within 10 days of employment. The dentist's employer must obtain proof from the physician who administered the vaccination and employees have the right to refuse the HBV vaccine. However, they must sign an informed refusal form that is kept on file in the office. The vaccine is administered in a series of three injections. Most common vaccination schedule is zero, one, and six months. The preferred injection site is in the deltoid muscle on the arm. The seroconversion rate or the development of immunity is higher than when the vaccine is administered in the buttocks. Post-vaccine testing. Between one to two months after the series has been completed, completed, a blood test should be performed to ensure that the individual has developed immunity. A physician should evaluate individuals who have not developed immunity to determine the need for an additional dose of HPV vaccine. Individuals who do not respond to the second three-dose series of the vaccine should be counseled regarding their susceptibility to HPV infection and precautions to take. Employee medical records. The dentist employer must keep a confidential medical record for each employee. That should be kept in your employee file. These records are confidential and must be stored in a locked file. The employer must keep these records for 30 years when you're not working there anymore. Managing contaminated sharps. Contaminated needles and other disposable sharps, for example, scalpel blades, orthodontic wires, and broken glass must be placed into a sharps container. And every operatory um, that you work in in an office, they will have their own sharps container. It needs to be in every single operatory. The sharps container must be puncture resistant, closable, 
leak proof and color coded or labeled with the biohazard symbol. Usually you see uh, those red bins, it's like a dark red bin color. Sharps containers must be located as close as possible to the place of immediate disposal. So usually if your operatory has a sink, it'll usually be um, right next to the sink or right next to the area where you work the most because sometimes the doctor will, he will bend the needle or he'll use a needle for sutures, which are stitches, and, and he needs to be, he needs to have access to that sharp container from where he's sitting. He doesn't, he doesn't have time to get up and walk across the room to put those sharps in the sharps container. So it needs to be close as possible, usually to where the area where you guys are working. Uh, do not cut, bend, or break the needles before disposal. Just throw them in there just as is. Never attempt to remove a needle from a disposable syringe. If it's a disposable syringe, you're just throwing it in there. Preventing needle sticks. Never recap used needles by using both hands or any other technique that involves direct, directing the point of a needle toward any part of the body. Always use the single-handed scoop technique or some type of safety, safety device. Some offices will have a needle cap. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. But it's actually like a little piece of cardboard and you'll put the cap of the needle in the middle and then you'll just use that to help you cap the needle back on. Okay, so hand hygiene, hand washing guidelines. Wash your hands each time before you put on gloves and immediately after you remove gloves. Wash your hands when you inadvertently touch contaminated objects or surfaces while barehanded. Always use liquid soap during hand washing. Bar soap should never be used because it may transmit contamination. So you're always going to use the, the usually like the foaming soap or a soap dispenser on the wall by the sink. For most routine dental procedures, such as, an, as, such as examinations and non-surgical procedures, an antimicrobial soap can be used. For surgical procedures, you should use a germicidal surgical scrub product. Dry hands well before donning gloves. Donning means putting gloves on. And let me tell you, you will have to practice at that because it doesn't matter how well you dry your hands. If they're a little bit humid, it's so hard to put on gloves. Additional hand washing guidelines. Keep nails short and well manicured. Rings, except for wedding rings, fingernail polish, and artificial nails are not to be worn at work. Um, ideally, you should not wear a, um, fake nails or acrylic nails. You should always keep your fingernails short though because um, it's very hard to work on temporaries or to work inside the patient's mouth if you have very long fingernails. Um, but, however, your specific office will tell you the guidelines and the rules if they accept artificial nails or not. And also, keep in mind the color of your nails. Um, where I used to work, they would not allow bright colors or red for your nails because red symbolizes um, like danger and you didn't want to scare the patient. And also bright colors were not allowed. You have to keep your nails uh, in like pastels or nudes. Dental personnel with open sores or weeping dermatitis must avoid activities involving direct patient contact and handling contaminated instruments or equipment until the condition of the hand is healed. Alcohol-based hand rubs. Waterless antiseptic agents are alcohol-based products available in gels, foams, or rinses. The product is applied to the hands which are then rubbed together to cover all surfaces. And basically what they're talking about is hand sanitizer. These products are most effective at reducing microbial flora than is plain soap. Concentrations of 60% to 95% are the most effective. They contain emollients that reduce the incidence of chapping, irritation, and drying of the skin. These products are very dose sensitive. Hand care recommendations. 
For most routine dental procedures, such as examinations and non-surgical procedures, wash your hands with either a non-antimicrobial or antimicrobial soap and water. If your hands are not visibly soiled, you may use a waterless alcohol-based hand rub. For surgical procedures, you should perform a surgical scrub using either a non-antimicrobial or antimicrobial soap and water, dry your hands, and apply an alcohol-based surgical hand rub. Now we're going to talk about personal protect protective equipment, also known as PPE. OSHA requires the employer to provide employees with the appropriate PPE without charge to the employee. Examples of PPE are protective clothing, so this can be gowns. Some offices actually um, take care of the expense of scrubs for you, and sometimes some offices even launder these scrubs for you. Surgical masks, face shields, protective eyewear, disposable patient treatment gloves, and heavy-duty utility gloves. Protective clothing. It protects the skin and underclothing from exposure to saliva, blood, aerosol, and other contaminated materials. Types of protective clothing include smocks, slacks, skirts, laboratory coats, surgical scrubs, hospital operating room clothing, uh, scrub surgical hats, pants, and shoe covers. And those are like the little boots that some people that you see at hospitals usually. The type of protective clothing you should wear is based on the degree of anticipated exposure to infectious materials. The BBP prohibits the employer from taking protective clothing home to be laundered. Yeah, that's not the case, but you have to wash your own scrubs because some offices do not have that option. They don't clean them for you. Protective clothing should be made of fluid resistant material. As a means of minimizing the amount of uncovered skin, clothing should have long sleeves and a high neckline. The design of the sleeve should allow the cuff to be tucked inside the band of the glove. Um, usually this is your lab jacket. During high risk procedures, protective clothing must cover dental personnel at least to the knees when seated. So the, your lab jacket or your gown that you'll be wearing, it needs to cover at least to your knees when you sit down on the dental system chair. Buttons, trims, zippers, and other ornamentation should be kept at a minimum. That's why most of the time you don't see scrubs. Scrubs don't really have a lot of zippers or buttons or anything like that. They're just pull on, you know, the, the shirt you pull over your head. Although some scrub tops do have zippers, but that's kind of rare. Um, and then the pants just have the drawstring and pockets. They rarely ever have any buttons or trims or anything like that because that harbors bacteria. Protective clothing may be laundered in the office if the equipment is available and if standard precautions are followed by, for handling and laundering the contaminated clothing. Contaminate, contaminated, linens, contaminated linens that are removed from the office for laundering should be placed in a leak-proof bag with a biohazard label or an appropriately color-coded label. Disposable gowns must be discarded daily and more often if visibly soiled. So disposable gowns are disposable. You should not be wearing them all week. You use one the whole day, um, you throw it out at the end of the day. If you, if you use one and you have a procedure where there was a lot of splatter and a lot of blood, etc., after the procedure, you take it off and you discard it and you put on a new one. Protective masks. 
warned over over the nose and mouth to protect you from inhaling possible infections organisms spread by the aerosol sprays of the handpiece or air water syringe and accidental splashes. A mask with at least 95% filtration efficiency for particles 3 millimeters to 5 millimeters in diameter should be worn whenever splash or spatter is likely. The two most commonly used type of mask are dome shape and flat. Guidelines for the use of masks. Masks should be changed for every patient or more often. For every patient or more often. CDC guideline. Um, you should be really changing your mask after every patient. To handle a mask, touch the side edges only. Avoid contact with the more heavily contaminate bo contaminated body of the mask. The mask should be conform well to the face. The mask should not make contact with the mouth while being worn because the moisture that is generated will decrease filtration efficiency. A damp or wet mask is not an effective mask. Protective eyewear. Worn to protect eyes against the danger of damage caused by our aerosolized pathogens. Also prevents spatter solutions or caustic chemicals from injuring the eyes. OSHA requires the use of eyewear with both front and side protection, solid side shields during exposure prone procedures. If you wear contact lenses, you must wear protective eyewear with side shields or a face shield. After each treatment or patient visit, clean and decontaminate protective eyewear in accordance with manufacturer's instructions or the CDC guidelines. Quick story. When I first work, started working as the dental assisting, many, many, many years ago in New York. Um, I was trained on the job. I didn't, I had never worked in dentistry before. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. So they basically hired me and cause they needed somebody very, very badly. And um, they trained me on the job. So I basically had to hit the ground running. Well, I was doing a, um, a root canal treatment with one of the doctors. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but in, in root canal treatments, the way that they um, kill, clean up the canals after they remove the nerve, um, they use bleach and they use disposable syringes. You put a little bit of watered down bleach in those disposable syringes and then the doctors will flush out the canals with that bleach. What happened was I was not wearing protective eyewear. And when the doctor, um, I did not put the needle in correctly in the disposable syringe. I didn't twist it and push it in correctly. So when the doctor went to squeeze the syringe, the needle flew off and the bleach squirted from inside the patient's mouth into my eyes. If you have never had bleach in your eyes before, you don't want to know what that feels like. And you know why that happened to me? Because I was not wearing my protective eyewear. I could have lost my vision. So that was my story and how I started wearing eye, uh, protective eyewear ever, every procedure after that. Face shields. A chin length plastic face shield may be worn as an alternative to protective eyewear. A shield cannot be substituted for a face mask because it does not protect against inhalation of contaminated aerosols. So anytime you're wearing a face shield, you need to be wearing a mask under it. Period. When splashing or spattering of blood or other body fluids is likely during a procedure such as surgery, a face shield is often worn in addition to a protective mask. Patient eyewear. Patients should be provided with protective eyewear because they also may be subject to eye damage during the procedure. This may result from hand piece spatter, spilled or splashed dental materials, including caustic chemical agents, airborne bits of acrylic or tooth fragments, and that is true. You will see bits of acrylic fly into the air. You will, if you're not wearing your protective eyewear, you will get pieces of ac acrylic in your eye and also tooth fragments from when they're cleaning out the teeth or removing old fillings. Gloves. Because dental personnel are most likely to come into contact with blood or contaminated items with their hands, gloves may be the most critical PPE. You must wear a new pair of gloves for each patient, remove them promptly after use, and wash your hands immediately to avoid the transfer of microorganisms to other patients or the environment. Consult with the glove manufacturer regarding the chemical compatibility of the glove material and the dental materials you use. All gloves used 
inpatient care must be discarded after a single use. These gloves may not be washed, disinfected, or sterilized. However, they may be rinsed with water to remove excess powder. Latex, vinyl, or other disposable medical quality gloves must be used for patient examinations and dental procedures. Torn or damaged gloves must be replaced immediately. So when it comes to latex, vinyl, um, where I used to work at, we stopped using latex gloves completely because a lot of people were allergic to latex. And that's something that you need to ask patients if you are working in an office that has latex gloves. Do not wear jewelry under the gloves. Change your gloves frequently. And jewelry meaning like uh, rings, because sometimes if you have a ring that has a very big stone or it's very protruding, it's not just like a wedding band, um, it can pierce the gloves and you might not even notice it. Remove contaminated gloves before leaving the chair side during patient care and replace them with new gloves before returning to patient care. Hands must be washed after glove removal and before regloving, or at least use hand sanitizer before doing that. Gloves damaged during treatment. Gloves are effective only when they are intact, not damaged, torn, ripped, or punctured. If gloves are damaged during treatment, they must be changed immediately. The procedure for regloving is excuse yourself and leave the chair side, remove and discard the damaged gloves, wash hands thoroughly, reglove before returning to the dental procedure. Gloves damaged by dental materials. The chemicals you come in contact with on a daily basis may damage your gloves. Because so many dental materials are available on the market, you should consult the glove manufacturer about the compatibility of the glove material with the various chemicals. This rarely ever happens. You just use the gloves. If they break, just change them. Examination gloves. They're usually made of latex or vinyl. They're referred to as exam gloves or procedure gloves. These are worn by dental professionals during patient care, and they're available in sizes small to extra large. Actually, they're available in extra small, too, because that's the size that I wear. I like my gloves to fit snug. I don't like them to be loose. It's hard to maneuver stuff in the mouth when your gloves are too big. Over gloves, also known as food handler gloves, and they're made of lightweight, inexpensive, clear plastic. These may be worn over contaminated treatment gloves, which is called over gloving, to prevent the contamination of clean objects handled during treatment. Those are like the lunch lady gloves. That's what they mean. They're made out of clear plastic and they're, they're super big. They're not meant to fit snug um, on your hands. They're meant to actually put them over something else. Guidelines for the use of over gloves. Over gloves are not acceptable alone as a hand barrier or for intraoral procedures. Over gloves must be worn carefully to avoid contamination during handling with contaminated procedure gloves. Over gloves are donned before the secondary procedure is performed and removed before the patient treatment that was in progress is resumed. Over gloves are discarded after a single use. Sterile surgical gloves. Sterile gloves should be worn for invasive procedures involving the cutting of bone or significant amount of blood or saliva, such as oral surgery or periodontal treatment. Sterile gloves are supplied in pre-packaged units to maintain their sterility before use. So they come in, they come individually packed in a, in a bag, in a sterile bag, and you have to open that bag. They don't come in boxes like the other gloves do. They are provided in specific sizes and are fitted to the left or right hand. Utility gloves. Utility gloves are not used for direct patient care. Utility gloves must be worn when the treatment room is being cleaned and disinfected between patients, while contaminated instruments are being cleaned or handled, and for surface cleaning and disinfection. So usually you'll find utility gloves in the lab, not really per se in the operatory room. Utility gloves may be washed, disinfected, or sterilized and reused. Utility gloves are kind of like uh, the dishwashing gloves, those yellow gloves, they're kind of like that. They're heavy, uh, they're thicker, um, and they're used to, you can wear them without gloves under or with gloves under, 
and you'll find them in the lab and they help they they're there for when you're sterilizing or cleaning dirty instruments from when you're taking no i don't want to say stuff out of the autoclave because there's special oven mitts for that um used utility gloves must be considered contaminated and handled appropriately until they have been properly disinfected or sterile. Usually when you take them off, you'll spray these with a, with a special type of solution and then you'll just hang them somewhere or over the sink to, to dry. Non-latex containing gloves. Healthcare providers or patients may experience serious allergic reactions to latex. For the person who is sensitive to latex, there are gloves made from vinyl, nitrile, and other non-latex containing materials. And nitrile is something that you'll see a lot. Um, they're much softer. They're made, um, it's, I want to say thicker because when you put them on, um, I feel like you can't feel your fingers as well or the stuff that you're touching as you would with latex because latex is more conforming to your hand. And some latex gloves actually have like, um, like texture on them, which help you grip stuff better. And I feel like nitrile don't have that. Maintaining infection control while gloves. During a dental procedure, it may be necessary to touch surfaces or objects such as drawer handles and mater material containers. If you touch these objects with a gloved hand, both the surface and glove become contaminated. To minimize the possibility of cross-contamination, use an overglove when it is necessary to touch a surface. So what I usually do with this type of stuff is if, if you're doing a procedure where you're going to have to take something out of a drawer, if I already know that I'm going to use this during the procedure, I just have everything out um, beforehand and then I'll set it to the side if I'm not sure if I'm going to use it or not. If it's something that comes in a box, like let's say um, some type of cement or anything like that, I'll take it out of the box, I'll leave the box in the drawer or wherever it was and I'll just have the containers out because the containers you can actually wipe them after you're done the box not really opening drawers and cabinets set up instruments medications and impression materials ahead of time and use disposable and unit dose items whenever possible opening containers when opening a container use over gloves a paper towel or a sterile gauze sponge to remove the lid or the cap use sterile cotton pliers to remove an item from the container so if you have to open a drawer and you have to remove either gauze or cotton rolls from your drawer, because you're going to have a lot of gauze and a lot of cotton rolls in there, use a sterile cotton plier, which means you're not using this cotton pliers for anything else but just um, touching stuff that's inside the drawer. You're not using it in the patient's mouth. You're not using it on anything that has already touched or been in the patient's mouth. You're using it specifically for that because if your gloves are dirty, and you go into your drawer and you take out cotton rolls or gauze, chances are you're going to touch the other clean stuff and then all that stuff in the drawer is going to be contaminated. High-tech equipment. Every aspect of dentistry is entering the arena of high-technology equipment and devices. You must carefully consider what infection control procedures are needed to make each piece of equipment safe to use. Always follow the manufacturer's infection control recommendations for every device and piece of equipment. And what basically what they mean by this is um, some equipment you cannot spray to clean it. So usually you'll have to either spray a paper towel and then wipe it. Um, sometimes you can't use a paper towel that's too damp, etc. So you need to find out what is the proper way to clean stuff um, so you won't damage the equipment. So talking about gloves, we're going to talk about latex allergies. The use of natural rubber latex gloves has proved to be one of the most effective means of protecting the dental worker and the patient from the transmission of disease. The number of healthcare workers and patients who have become hypersensitive to latex has increased dramatically, hence why the office where I used to work for, not only that office, but all the offices from the company, we got rid of latex gloves um, and we were using the nitro. The CDC guidelines include recommendations for contact dermatitis and latex hypersensitivity. Three common types of allergic reactions to latex, irritant dermatitis, type four allergic reaction, and type one allergic reaction. 
two types involve an immune reaction and one type involves only surface irritation. Irritant dermatitis, a non-immunological process. It does not involve the body's immune system. It's caused by contact with a substance that produces chemical irritation of the skin. The skin becomes reddened, dry, irritated, and in severe cases, cracked. Irritant dermatitis can be reversed by identifying and correcting the cause of the problem. Type 4 allergic reaction. The most common type of latex allergy is a delayed contact reaction and involves the immune system. It may take as long as 48 or 72 hours for the red itchy rash to appear. Reactions are limited to the areas of contact and do not involve the entire body. So you'll probably see it like around the patient's mouth or, you know, wherever they were touched by the latex. An immune response is produced by the chemicals that are used to process the latex used in manufacturing the gloves, not by the proteins in the latex. Type 1 allergic reaction. It's the most dangerous type of latex allergy and can result in death comes in response to the latex protein in the glove, in contrast to the reaction to chemical additives in type 4 reactions. A severe immunological immune system response usually occurs 2-3 to three minutes after the latex allergens make contact with the skin or mucous membrane. Treatment of latex allergies. There is no specific cure for latex allergy. The only options are prevention, avoidance of latex-containing products, and treatment of the symptoms. Anyone who suspects an allergy to latex should see a qualified healthcare provider to have a test to confirm the allergy. Once a latex allergy has been diagnosed, the affected person should practice latex avoidance in all aspects of his or her personal and professional life. Most people, they'll know already um, if they have a latex allergy or not because they will let you know that when you, per when you see them or they'll write it down in, under their medical history. I think there's a section in there that says if you're allergic to latex. When a latex allergy has been diagnosed in one employee in the dental office, all staff members should use practices to minimize the use of latex containing products. Practices include the wearing of powder free gloves by all dental staff members to minimize the risk of airborne latex particles. Waste management in the dental office. Dental practices are subject to a wide variety of federal, state, and local regulations concerning waste management issues. The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and most state and local regulations do not categorize saliva or saliva-soaked items as infections waste. Because of the high probability, probability, uh, probability that blood may be carried in saliva, during dental procedures, the CDC guidelines and OSHA regulations consider saliva and dentistry a potentially infectious body fluid. So classification of waste, general waste. All non-hazardous, non-regulated waste should be discarded in covered containers. Examples include disposable paper towels, paper mixing pads, and empty food containers. Contaminated waste is waste that has, that, that has had contact with blood or other body fluids. The examples include used barriers and patient napkins. Now, hazardous, hazardous waste, it possesses a, a risk to human beings and the environment. Toxic chemicals and materials are hard, hazardous waste. Examples include scrap amalgam, spent fixer solution, and lead foil from x-ray film packets. Infectious or regulated waste, which is also known as biohazard, is contaminated waste that is capable of transmitting as infectious disease. Some items, such as extracted teeth with amalgam restorations, may be both hazardous waste because of the amalgam and infectious waste because of the blood. Most dental offices are exposed to the following types of infectious waste, blood and blood soaked materials, pathological waste, and sharps. Handling extracted teeth. Dispose of extracted teeth as regulated medical waste unless being returned to the patient. And even some offices won't let the patients keep their teeth unless they're, they're children and, you know, they want to keep them for the tooth fairy. We discard all of that. When teeth are returned to the patient, the provision of the standard no longer apply. Do not dispose of extracted teeth containing amalgam in regulated medical waste that will be incinerated. Because of the mercury in the amalgam fillings, you should check with state and local authorities for regulations regarding disposal 
of teeth containing amalgam. And your office will let you know that. Handling contaminated waste. Contaminated items may contain body fluids, such as gloves and patient napkins should be placed in a lined trash receptacle. A receptacle for contaminated waste should be covered with a property, properly fitted lid opened by a foot pedal, which means that you press the foot pedal to open it. You should never have to touch the lid. Keep the lid closed to prevent air movement and the spreading of contaminants. Red bags or containers should not be used for unregulated waste. Check the specific requirements of your local state or county health department. So this is going to be a completely different bin and it might be in the um, in the lab and it's usually either a big cardboard box or a designated bin and in there you're going to see all the red bags that um, the biohazard bags will be in there and it should be closed because yes uh, stuff can you know get into the air from those bags and those bags only I mean those bins are only emptied every once in a while when the company comes to empty it out when it's full and you call the company to come to empty it Handling medical waste. Medical waste is any solid waste generated in the diagnosis, treatment, or immunization of human beings or animals in research. Infectious waste, a subset of medical waste. Containers of infectious waste, regulated waste, must be labeled with the universal biohazard symbol, identified in compliance with local regulations or both. Containers used for holding contaminated items must be labeled. The disposal of medical waste. Once contaminated waste leaves the office, it is regulated by the EPA and by state and local laws. Under most regulations, the manner of disposal, of disposal is determined by the amount or the weight of the infectious material requiring disposal. The average dental practice is categorized as a small producer of infectious waste, and disposal is regulated accordingly. The law requires the dentist to maintain records of the final disposal of this medical waste including documentation of how, when, and where it was disposed. Additional infection control practices, OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard, never eat, drink, smoke, apply cosmetic or lip balm, or handle contact lenses in any area of the dental office where contamination is possible, such as the dental treatment rooms, dental laboratory, sterilization area, or the area for the processing of x-rays. Never store food or drink in a refrigerator that contains any potentially contaminated items. You can minimize the amount of splash and spatter contamination produced during dental procedures with the skillful use of dental dam and high volume evacuation. High volume evacuation is also known as the HVE. The CDC guidelines, special considerations, saliva ejectors. Do not advise patients to close their lips tightly around the tip of the saliva ejector to evacuate oral fluids. Many patients have become accustomed to closing their lips around the suction. CDC guidelines, the dental laboratory. Use PPE when handling items in the laboratory until they have been decontaminated. Clean, disinfect, and rinse all dental prostheses and prosthodontic materials, for example, impressions, bite registration, occlusal rims, and extracted teeth. Consult with manufacturers regarding the stability of specific materials, impression materials, relative to disinfection procedure. Clean, heat, sterilize, heat-tolerant items used in the mouth. Follow manufacturer's instructions for cleaning sterilizing or disinfecting items that become contaminated but do not normally come in contact with the patient. Free procedural mouth rinses intended to reduce the number of microorganisms released in the form of aerosol or spatter can decrease the number of microorganisms introduced into the patient's bloodstream during invasive dental procedures. Scientific evidence that pre procedural mouth rinsing prevents clinical infections among dental health professionals or patients is inconclusive. This is an unresolved issue and no recommendation has been made. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, also known as TB. For patients with known or suspected active TB, the CDC recommends that elective dental treatment be delayed until the patient is non-infectious. For patients who require urgent dental care, the CDC recommends
neurologic disorders. It affects both human beings and animals and is thought to be caused by infection with prions. Prion diseases have an incubation period for, of years but are usually fatal within one year of diagnosis. Infectivity of oral tissues in CJD patients is an unresolved issue. No recommendation is offered regarding the use of special precautions in addition to standard precautions in the treatment of patients with known CJD. Laser, electrosurgery, plumes, or surgical smoke. In surgical procedures involving the use of laser or electrosurgical unit, a smoke byproduct is created during the thermal destruction of the tissue, and that smoke smells. Laser plumes and surgical smoke pose a risk to dental health care professionals. The effect of the exposure, disease transmission, or adverse respiratory effects on dental health care professionals results from the use of lasers in dentistry has not been adequate, uh, adequately evaluated. Anytime that my doctor used to use an electrosurgical unit, it was for burning of the gums to stop the bleeding, basically. So that creates a smoke. So what I used to do was I just used to wave the HVE, the high volume suction, around and just suck in the smoke so it wouldn't get too much into the air.